Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If in the 22nd century a book will be written about the entrepreneur of the 21st century, I'm sure, or even of the 20th century, I'm sure that the person who will foremost come to the mind of those historians is certainly Bill Gates. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and for the privilege of speaking to this forum. As you all may know, in July, I'll make a big career change. I'm not worried. I believe I'm still marketable. I'm a self-starter. I'm proficient in Microsoft Office. I guess that's it. Uh, also, I'm learning how to give money away. The world is getting better, a lot better. In significant and far-reaching ways, the world is a better place to live than it has ever been. Consider the status of women and minorities in society, virtually any society, compared to any time in the past. Consider that life expectancy has nearly doubled during the last 100 years. Consider governance, the number of people today who vote in elections, express their views, and enjoy economic freedom compared to any time in the past. We're really just at the beginning of this technology-driven revolution in what people can do for one another. In the coming decades, we'll have astonishing new abilities, better software, better uh, diagnosis for illnesses, better cures, better education, better opportunities, and more brilliant minds coming up with ideas that solve tough problems. This is how I see the world, and it should make one thing clear. I'm an optimist, but I'm an impatient optimist. The world is getting better, but it's not getting better fast enough, and it's not getting better for everyone. The great advances in the world have often aggravated the inequalities in the world. The least needy see the most improvement, and the most needy get the least, in particular, the billion people who live on less than a dollar a day. There are roughly a billion people in the world who don't get enough food, who don't have clean drinking water, who don't have electricity, the things that we take for granted. Diseases like malaria that kill over a million people a year get far less attention than drugs to help with baldness. So the bottom billion misses the benefits of the global economy. And yet they'll suffer from the ne negative effects of economic growth they missed out on. Climate change will have the biggest impact on people who have done the least to cause it. Why do people benefit in inverse proportion to their need? Well, market incentives make that happen. In a system of capitalism, as people's wealth rises, the financial incentive to serve them rises. As their wealth falls, the financial incentive to serve them falls until it becomes zero. We have to find a way to make the aspects of capitalism that serve wealthier people serve poorer people as well. For sustainability, we need to use profit incentives wherever we can. At the same time, Profits are not always possible when business tries to serve the very poor. In such cases, there needs to be another incentive, and that incentive is recognition. Recognition enhances a company's reputation and appeals to customers. Above all, it attracts good people to an organization. As such, recognition triggers a market-based reward for good behavior. In markets where profits are not possible, recognition is a proxy. Where profits are possible, recognition can be an added incentive. 
because profits and recognition are renewable resources. Klaus Schwab runs a foundation that assists social entrepreneurs around the world. There are a number of pharmaceutical companies like GlaxoSmithKline that are already putting their top innovators to work on new approaches to help the poor. We're living in a phenomenal age. If we can spend the early decades of the 21st century finding approaches that meet the needs of the poor in ways that generate profits and recognitions for business, we will have found a sustainable way to reduce poverty in the world. Well, certainly the uh, foundation that my wife and I have has found it extremely important to reach out to private organizations. Uh, a lot of those are partnerships with drug companies where they're dedicating some of their best people and taking risk, but we take on some of the financial burden so it's within the reach of what they can responsibly do. Uh, for them, the opportunity cost is actually uh, the greatest thing that they give, although sometimes there's a, a financial contribution as well. And would you have any advice for governments? Well, I mentioned in the speech the thing that happened in the United States. It didn't get much visibility, which is this fast-track grant yeah, yeah. in the FDA. Uh, I didn't mention this idea of advanced market commitment, uh, which has now been applied to a particular vaccine for pneumonia, pneumococcus vaccine. There's a fund of a billion and a half dollars, uh, virtually all government money, a little bit of uh, foundation money. Uh, what, what would you like to see as your uh, legacy in 10, 15 years? Uh, of the new work? Of the new work, yeah. yeah. If your new function. Well, I, I set very ambitious goals because I'm quite optimistic. If you look at, say, the, the 20 diseases uh, that our global health program goes after, I'd hope that within 15 years, over half of those, we could have had a very dramatic impact. Uh, some of them will prove to be harder than others. For example, AIDS, uh, we will have made an improvement, but not the dramatic improvement probably in that time frame. Malaria, perhaps, and a number of the other ones, uh, we have things in the pipeline. So, you know, huge change in the uh, mortality rates in developing countries, which then has this effect of reducing population growth. That's the, this big benefit mm -hmm. that then makes everything like education and nutrition a lot easier. There's the specific work in, in the different divisions, health, development, and the U.S. education work, uh, that in 15 years, boy, we, uh, you know, by then we will have spent a lot of money. Three billion a year, 15 years, that uh, adds up. Uh, and for that, uh, people should have a very high expectation of, of what we can do. I think the first thing to recognize about hunger is that today it's a rural phenomena, it's mainly in third world countries, and it's mainly among communities that are actually agricultural communities. So why are people who are growing food going hungry themselves? They're going hungry because everything they have grown has to be sold in order to pay for the costly seeds and the costly chemicals. So a high cost chemical intensive agriculture is a recipe for hunger. Secondly, the models of agriculture that chemical farming has promoted are monocultures. Monocultures are nutritionally impoverished. The same acre of land using biodiversity, using organic and ecological methods could produce five to ten times more nutrition than a monoculture can. So maximizing the production of commodities for international trade is directly proportionate to the decrease in nutrition availability to local communities, which is why hunger grows. If we, the world has to be fed, it has to be fed by growing food locally, to be used locally as the biggest proportion of the food basket. Some elements will be traded internationally, but what is traded internationally should not be staple foods. W what is traded internationally should be that extra flavor of spices from India and coffee from Guatemala. That's all right. But to turn the world into a dependency on staples has nothing to do with feeding the world. It has a lot to do with controlling the food supply. The United States evolved a phrase during the Vietnam War, and the war phrase was food as a weapon. The use of food 
as the ultimate weapon of control. And the tragedy is the growth of agribusiness in the US has gone hand in hand with the US foreign policy to deliberately create hunger locally in order to make the world dependent on food supplies through which you can then control countries and their decision making ability. So hunger is, has become an instrument of war and food responding to that artificially created hunger is an instrument of war. Peace means you grow food locally, you grow food with peace, you grow food non-violently and the countries that are today the worst victims of hunger could be the highest producer of food. Africa has the largest land per, per human being, per capita. Africa is an abundant continent and yet because of the deliberate policies it has today been turned into a continent of hunger. India, which has the best soils, the best monsoons, the highest biodiversity, should not have any problem. We are growing enough food and yet 70% of our children are going hungry because the economic system is robbing them of their right to food. So food production must once again be an issue of sustainability, taking care of the earth and the human right to food must be an inalienable right. These rights cannot be ensured through a marketplace where food has become a commodity and an, a subject of speculation. We saw what speculation did in 2008. Food prices doubled and the companies that control the food system double their profits while riots took place in 40 countries. And what there is is really there's an enormous disparity between what empires actually do and how they're represented in history. This is what I found. That empires are pretty much written about by people who live in the imperial countries. And so the the treatment of empires is rather celebratory. Empires are often represented at crea as creations of peace. They're even given names of peace, right? Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The Roman peace was a brutal, bloody world conquest, as I'll mention in more detail in a minute. Pax Britannica, and there's even Pax Americana, just so you don't think I'm attacking straw men. Oh, who says that? Who thinks that way? Let me read to you from one great student of empire. He wrote a masterpiece of a multi-volume work. It's called The, the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Edward Gibbon. Now, this is what Edward Gibbon says. The obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary, and permanent. The vanquished nations blended into one great people. Resi they resigned the hope, nay, even the wish, of resuming their independence. The vast Roman Empire was governed by absolute power under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. Yeah, right. That's the description he gives. John Morley, English political leader and writer, talking about the British Empire, 1877. We have had imposed upon us by the unlucky prowess of our ancestors the task of ruling millions of alien dependents. We undertake it with a disinterestedness and execute it with a skill of administration to which history supplies no parallel. Yeah, again, uh, I mean, let's deconstruct that a minute, would you? I mean, millions of alien dependents? Who made them dependents? They didn't ask to be made dependents on the British. They were brutally conquered by the British. They were independents until the British came along. You didn't inherit them. You went out and got this whole thing. The US, too. Here, very recently, the year 2003, The Economist, a, a conservative British publication, no author. <clears throat> Empires are born in funny ways and sometimes via the law of unintended consequences, by accident, and so with the American empire. I mean, it's really, <clears throat> it's really interesting, isn't it? We hear that today also in a slightly different idiom. We hear that the United States, in, in terms of the United States, we hear uh, 
the United States was, I mean, that's the first one where I, where I found the absent-mindedness thing used again. But generally, there's another way of saying it. Say, the United States was, was thrusted onto the world stage. Or after World War II, we found ourselves uh, having to take up the mantle of world leader. But we were just you know, thrusted into this thing. They never say who did the thrusting. You know, some, what was it, the Canadians and the Mexicans kind of pushing us and saying, come on, come on. Go rule the world, maybe. Leave us alone for a while or something. I don't know. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, I think a moment's reflection would tell you that empires are products of deliberate contrivance, of deliberate confection, planning, calculation, and manipulation. No social order can maintain itself in the long run. No social order can maintain itself without conscious human agency. In fact, that's why you have a state. The state is the conscious human agency of coercion to maintain a particular set of interests and order, which not, don't necessarily always look out for our interests. You know. See, that's the magic of words. You, you, you wish away or you define away um, all sorts of brutal histories and realities by just using a different word. You got the administration today in Washington saying that the Geneva Convention does not apply to the people who are being held in captivity under very bad conditions at Guantanamo by the United States because they're not prisoners of war. They're enemy combatants. But you know, enemy combatant incarcerated by your military, that's the definition of a prisoner of war. That's what a prisoner of war is. You get the enemy's combatant and you make prisoners out of them. So this use of, it's interesting how terms are now just being used to wish away things and situations. And this has happened with empire as with any of these other deceptions. Why do people go out and conquer other places? It's usually assumed, I mean, you can read a whole history of the Mongol Empire, you know, or they, you know, and such, and Genghis Khan came here, and then they went here, and they destroyed these towns, and they went there, and they fought that battle, and they did it, and all these details, and all through, but nobody ever asked, well, why? Why are they doing all this stuff? Is this just stuff happens again, you know? It's just in a fit of ferocious absent-mindedness, they're at it again, or what is it? Actually, it's not conquest just for conquest's sake. It's not power just for power's sake. It's really power just for power's sake. Of course, individual, individuals try to pursue and project their careers to get up there to get into positions of power and will sell their souls for anything. But generally, even they have to operate in a field of interest. There are interests involved. There are very real material interests at stake. There's plunder, and there's tribute, and there are resources, and markets, and there's expropriating the land, and the crops, and the natural resources, and the minerals, and the wealth, and the cheap labor, or in the case of Rome, the slave labor. If you want to know why so many countries in the third world are so poor, just look at the history of imperialism. They weren't naturally and inevitably poor. They were made poor. Underdevelopment was something that was imposed on them. They were developing. They had wealth. Many of them had very advanced civilizations. They were forced back and plundered and impoverished. Empires are enormously profitable, mostly for the ruling class. Empires are also enormously costly, mostly for the common populace. The people of Rome didn't do too well on the empires. They got a grain dole, and that was it. They often paid the price in blood. They were piled up in tenements and like, and that's the truth of every empire. The empire feeds off the resources of the republic, and that was true of the Roman Empire in its days of right to the late republic. That was true of the British Empire, and that's true today. The people pay the taxes and do without essentials, so that the patricians can pursue their far-off plunder. The center is bled 
so that the perimeter can expand. Athens is defunded and starved so that Sparta can batten and grow ever more powerful. We see that happening today right here in this country. $200 billion being spent in Iraq. We don't know where half, where one third the money's going. The Pentagon has admitted at least one third of the money is totally unaccountable. They just don't know. We're talking about billions of dollars here. Where is all the money going, everyone's asking. Well, for some people, empire is quite profitable. Don't, don't ever say that George Bush's policy in Iraq isn't working. It's working. It's just not working for you or for me, or for the Iraqis. But it's working for certain interests. It's working in the way that empires have always worked. To say George Bush's policy isn't working is a senseless comment. It's not a political comment. It's not a politically defined comment. So discard it, because you have to say, working for whom? Whose interest? Cui bono is the Latin phrase. Who benefits? Who gets the payoff on this? And just because many of our liberal commentators don't know what they're doing doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. You get it? And when you think, when you think those who rule you, when you think those who rule the wealth and control the markets and the labor and the resources of society and set the wages and define the labor market and and control the media culture and all that. When you think they're stupid, then you're being stupid. You got that? Okay. If you learn, if you learn that tonight, and you learn, and, and you don't know, and if you know that, and you don't know anything else, you know more than if you know everything else, but you don't know that. So you got to really know that. My guest today is Vandana Shiva. She is a world famous environmental activist from India. She's a laureate of the alternative. Nobel Prize in 1993. She's author of numerous books. Her latest is called Oneness versus 1%. Thank you very much for being on the phone. My podcast. pleasure. I want to begin uh, early on. You were not uh, supposed to be an activist. Uh, you were a physicist. You wanted to work in nuclear energy. And then uh, you came across in the early 1970s what is known in India as the Shipko movement. Can you explain us how you came across? Yeah. Yes, I was training to be in India's nuclear establishment. But then my sister woke me up to the hazards of nuclear. She was a medical doctor. And I went deeper into theoretical physics. I was going to Canada to do a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And before I went, I wanted to visit some of my favorite forests in the Himalaya. I've grown up in the Himalayan forest. And this forest I had trekked in was gone. The stream that came from this oak forest was gone. And while returning to Delhi, I talked to a tea shop owner, and he talked about how there's a new movement called Chipko. So in my heart, I said, I'm going to come back every vacation and be a volunteer for this movement. Women came out to say, we're going to hug the trees. You cannot cut the trees because from the trees come our water. The trees stabilize the mountain and prevent landslides. The trees prevent floods and droughts, and they also give us everything we need. We will be huggers of trees. The name Chipko means to hug. And I learned all my lessons of ecological activism from the women of the Himalaya who had never been to school but knew everything about ecology, knew everything about biodiversity. What they called soil, water, and pure air today talked about as ecological functions of the forests that forests are not timber mines. And a lot of my change in the understanding of the fact that nature is the basis of economy came from my engagement with Chipko. My respect for women's knowledge, indigenous knowledge, came from my engagement with Chipko. And it totally turned my own head upside down because of physics, you know, high in the world, you know something others don't. And you re I realized everyone has knowledge and right. you must respect it. So uh, you've uh, became really engaged in this. Uh, you've been an opponent of uh, big multinational corporations, especially uh, Monsanto, uh, to name just uh, one, uh, because of what you describe as their nefarious influence on uh, agriculture. Uh, there are a number of examples. There was the BT cotton 
uh, in, in India uh, especially. Uh, and you said, you know, uh, this is not a matter of helping farmers grow their land, but actually making them dependent on those big corporations. Um, you know, the entry of corporations into agriculture is so wrong because the corporations only bring poisons. Most of them have roots in Hitler's Germany in making gases to kill people in concentration but that's camps. What, that was not their aim. Their aim no. was to give people enough. No, no, no. The aim was to make chemicals that kill people. After the wars, they said, why should we stop making these chemicals? Let's say now they'll kill pests. They will give fertilizer. Fertilizers were made in the same factories that made explosives and ammunition for Hitler's That's Germany. That's not the same goal. No, the, the, or the companies are the same and the processes are the same. So your rhetoric might change, but the goal does not. The materiality of a death-making chemical doesn't change when you say it's now for prefeeding the world. I did a book on the violence of the Green Revolution because Punjab, the most fertile land of India, was destroyed. And then when Monsanto came in as a result of globalization, because till uh, the 90s, 90% of the seed was in farmers' hands and the rest came from the public sector, from the government labs, the research institutions. So Monsanto came illegally, didn't take any approval, with the promise that they would increase farmers' incomes and have this magical co technology to control pests. Well, the bollworm is now resistant. Farmers are in debt. Farmers are committing suicide. The area has been ruined. The pollinators are gone. There's no pollinator. The groundwater is gone. So there's nothing about the ecosystem. So I save seeds. We brought organic cotton seeds back. We work with the Gandhi ashrams on hand spinning and hand weaving of this organic cotton. The economy in the villages where we work has jumped tenfold because now the wealth is staying in the village rather than being siphoned off as Monsanto's profit. And I read a new study that says because we've saved seeds, we brought local seeds that can be saved back into the economy. Monsanto has lost 11 million. I, I want to get to your latest book because uh, you widen, I would say, uh, your attacks. It's not only Monsanto and, and the likes, but also uh, others. Uh, you uh, attack the what you describe as the billionaire uh, dictators, especially uh, one man, I should say, uh, Bill Gates, uh, who uh, you describe as the Christopher Columbus, I'm uh, quoting you, of modern times, and that's not a compliment, obviously, uh, whose mission is to impose, quote-unquote, genetically modified organisms and digital dictatorship to small farmers across the world. Bill Gates, who's donated billions uh, to improve public health in poor countries and so on, you're saying, essentially, he's a dictator, And he's there not to help, but to make people poor, more dependent. Well, Bill Gates is actually continuing the work of Monsanto uh, because Monsanto had so many movements. And we held a, a tribunal on Monsanto. Um, a buyer bought up Monsanto. But when Bill Gates pours money into Africa for feeding the poor in Africa and preventing famine, what's he doing? He's pushing the failed green revolution. He's pushing chemicals, pushing GMOs, pushing patents. And now pushing new... Knowingly, or he thinks it's a good thing and he may be wrong. Well, there's it's not enough, the same thing. There's enough evidence of what it does. There are enough letters to him from farmers of Africa, from governments of Africa to say, this is not the way to go. The United Nations accepts agroecology working with ecological systems as the best way to go. Now, you, um, Bill Gates is trying very hard to shift the patenting issue now to digital. So you just take a dynamic map and you say, my invention, you don't create a seed. Seed is self-organized, self-making, and evolution in continuity. Just by re making a map, a genome, and you have no idea what the seed does. And he, this is something he's pushing very, very hard. My book records how he financed DivSeek. Um, I've talked about how he's pirated. Seeds we have saved that tolerates salt and floods, and he says invention. This biopiracy is a bit like Columbus, where Columbus is supposed to have discovered America, when he basically went as a pirate. Why do I call him today's Columbus? Because he's carving out new colonies. 
software should have stayed open software. So, so he said, you say he has a, a strategy, a nefarious uh, strategy, what you describe as philanthrocapitalism uh, is a nefarious enterprise. And so you're not saying he's using the wrong methods. He's pursuing a wrong goal with self-interest. You also uh, uh, attack Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the founder of, of Facebook, saying they're all linked together. I mean, this reeks a bit of conspiracy theory, doesn't it? Well, you know, my book is based on the new evidence that's coming out. All you have to do is the, or, or see the ownership, and I have data in the book on how there's common ownership. We stopped Mark Zuckerberg from trying to get into Indian agriculture It was a big mobilization of people who believe in the open internet. What did he want to do? Well, you know, basically what they do is they mine the data from the farmers. And right now, all over the world, there's new debates on privacy issues, on the right. data mining. There's new books and new form of capitalism, which is surveillance capitalism, where you basically have turned human beings into your new raw material. So Bill Gates does both. He takes living resources and our seeds and biodiversity mines it into data and wants ownership along with his friends. And Mark Zuckerberg mines your data and your behaviors and turns it into the raw material, both of corporate world for selling things, which is why strange advertisements pop up after you've sent a message to a friend, and manipulating elections. I have a chapter in the book on the hijack of democracy. You have enough data on what happened with Facebook selling data to Cambridge Analytica and how we are popping up with artificial intelligence leaders. This is a major threat to democracy. So this is why you're calling them billionaire dictators, because you think they're not helping democracy, but actually threatening and even killing it. I mean, Wait, isn't this it, I have, too much? No, I have grown up in an India that was post-independence. I've grown up in an India that had absolutely no corporations. I've grown up in an in India where democracy works. And therefore, when I see the imposition of digital transactions and criminalization of cash between poor people, I basically see this as a dictatorship. I call it digital dictatorship. When I watch not just in India, but in Africa and other parts of the world. Now that we have the data that is showing that native seeds have more nutrition, they produce more food, they have no cost because you don't have to use chemicals, that local biodiversity is the way to feeding the world, in spite of all that evidence, in spite of the evidence in the United Nations, in the FAO, in UNCTAD, every agency, Bill Gates is still imposing and forcing GMOs which is a failed enterprise. And he's not just imposing GMOs, he's taking what has failed and rejected by, go by governments. My government threw the BT aubergine of Monsanto out. Bill Gates resurrects it in Bangladesh. We rejected the golden rice for solving the problem of blindness. He finances it to continue through Philippines. So he's taking all the failed projects with the wrong thinking that life is like a word program and can be chopped and cut and pasted when it's an amazing complexity of self-organization, and scientists call it autopoiesis, self-organization, writing your own poetry. That's what life does. He is absolutely ignoring all of this new knowledge that new science is giving us and imposing a failed technology with a huge cost to the planet, only so there can be monopolies and people and farmers aren't free to have their seed. Well, Dana Shiva, obviously, uh, you have strong views, and we're happy that you were able to share them. Uh, with But them. that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years brings us to another revelation, namely that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich, Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there to be carved out and to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, 
and the cheap labor they have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. 